This is the lecture for Nick Zangwell's Love, Gloriously Amoral and Irrational. So we're going to start off just talking broadly about conceptual analysis because uh, this comes up in this paper and it's also something that we're going to be thinking a lot about in the love section. So on the second page he says, it might seem natural to begin, oops, it might seem natural to begin thinking about love by asking the Socratic style question, what is love? Having answered that question, we could then go on to ask further questions about its value, about its implications, about its place in normative moral theory, and so on. In Plato's Mino, Socrates recommends that we should first ask what virtue is, and only after that can we ask whether it can be taught. Similarly, the idea is that the idea would be that we should first ask what love is, then ask about its value. And he sort of goes on to say, that's not exactly how he wants to uh, do it. He wants to do things differently. But the broad point that he's going to be looking at and that everybody is going to be looking at is uh, basically that question. So what is love? Or what should we think about love? What is this thing? And so this is uh, something that philosophers do. And this is something that everybody does. All fields do this sort of thing. All fields have topics which are important to them and they want to be able to sort of say things about these topics. And it's worth just uh, thinking about what is it that we're doing when we try to figure out what to say about some topic. So what is it that we're doing when we try to figure out what we say about love? Philosophy has lots and lots of things to say about conceptual analysis and what it is to engage in conceptual analysis. Conceptual analysis is a very old thing for philosophy. When we go on to read Plato, we're going to see him do some conceptual analysis, especially in Euthyphro, where he's going to be analyzing piety. And so uh, it's worth thinking because this paper especially is doing it very forthrightly. It's saying uh, we're going to do conceptual analysis about love. And so it's worth thinking about that project. And uh, especially in section one of this paper, which is sort of, it's about uh, methodology and uh, how we should think about the concept of love. So that's the first point. The second point, sort of related, uh, is just a small thing that he doesn't explain. So given a focus on the what is love question, the dialectic tends to play out as follows. A theory is proposed as an answer to the question, and that theory is then tested for extensional adequacy. For example, someone proposes, love is the desire to benefit and be with. No, comes the reply. What about annoying interfering relatives who one nevertheless loves? So uh, just to explain this phrase, extensional adequacy, the way we think about concepts in philosophy is that they have an intention and an extension. So I should write intention here. So the intention of a concept is sort of the definition of the concept. So it's whatever it means. So for example, the definition would be love is the desire to benefit and then and be with. And then the extension of the concept is everything that it applies to. So if love is the desire to benefit and be with, then all of the things that are desiring to benefit and be with, those are love. And all the things, all the other things are not love. So for instance, whatever feeling you have about annoying interfering relatives, uh, since you don't desire to benefit and be with them, that can't be love. And then you say, well, but I do love those relatives, so there must be something wrong with my definition. I got the wrong definition, the wrong intention. Why do I know I've got the wrong intention, the wrong definition? Oh, because it's sort of extensionally inadequate. It sort of, it doesn't extend to all the things that it should extend. My definition of love should extend to all the cases of love. So when we test a theory or when we test a definition for extensional adequacy, we're saying, here's our theory, here's our definition of what something is. Let's see if it sort of gets the cases right. Let's see if it classifies all the love things as love and all the non-love things as non-love. Uh, one example of this is allegedly uh, some philosopher in ancient Greece was trying to define uh, human beings and they settled on uh, an, a featherless biped. And then someone came along with a plucked chicken and said, oh, you're wrong. See, this is not a human being. And so that's an extensionally inadequate definition of humans because it says all the humans are all the featherless bipeds, but here's a featherless biped, a plucked chicken, which is not a human. So 
my definition is, is extensionally inadequate. Again, still on page 299, our next topic, uh, consequentialism and Kantianism and problems with love. So uh, he says, the presupposition that we should prioritize the what is love question seems to fit some aspects of intellectual life on the topic of love, which divides into an intrinsic interest in love and an interest in it for its impact on the normative theories of consequentialism and Kantianism, which have a hard time placing love in their theories in a plausible way. So this doesn't matter for this article very much, and it doesn't matter for the other articles we're going to read, but it is an interesting topic to think about when it comes to love, which is our topic in this unit, and also for Plato's symposium. So what are sort of the problems that consequentialism and Kantianism have with love? So what are consequentialism and Kantianism? So we talked about consequentialism back in the lecture for Julia Driver's Caesar's Wife thing, so you can go back and read or and watch that lecture. But basically, consequentialism is a moral theory that says the right thing to do is whatever leads to the best consequences. And the issue that consequentialism has with love is that it seems like consequentialism tells you to do one thing, but that seems sort of incompatible with love on the other hand. So for instance, if there are two boats on the water, and they're both sinking, and you can only save the people in one boat, and one boat has your family on it, and another boat has just a bunch of strangers, but let's say there's five members of your family on the one boat and six strangers, you might think, well, I don't know, just from the point of view of consequences, saving six lives is typically better than saving five lives. So in lots of cases, consequentialism is going to tell you you should save the strangers, but it seems strange to say that you should have to save six strangers over five of your family members uh, from a sinking boat. And so the thought is, why is that strange? Well, because you love your family members and you have absolutely no connection to these strangers. And so you have more reason to save the ones you love than people you have no connection with. And so consequentialism seems to have problems with love. He also says Kantianism has problems with love. So what is Kantianism? Kantianism is a form of deontology, which we also look, we saw in the lecture for Driver, so you can go back and watch that. Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure he's right that Kantianism has lots of problems with love, but uh, we're going to see some problems with a Kantian approach to love in, you know, um, section two of this article. So if you're interested in what the Kantian issues with love might be, he thinks at least that he's pointing out some here in section two, uh, as see, he calls it a Kantian form of love. So stay tuned for that if you're interested in Kantianism. Next topic, subscripted love. So this is just because he doesn't explain the topic. So um, he says, nevertheless, some observations about our concept of love will help us. Ascriptions of love are often qualified by filial, maternal, brotherly, sexual, friendship, etc. We might call this phenomenon subscripted love. And this is just confusing because he never explains it, nor does he go on to do anything with it. I don't think he uses the word subscripted love ever again. But just what he means is like, he's imagining writing out, as I have here on this outline, uh, love subscript filial, love subscript maternal, love subscript brotherly. And we would do that, like why would we have these little subscripts attached? We do that because we can tell the different kinds of love apart. Because English just has the one word, love, and so if I just keep using love every time, I have to keep qualifying it and stuff. And so just to be clear about what kind of love I'm talking about, I would sort of write love with a little subscript to spell it out. Again, this is confusing because he never actually does this in the article. He never uses subscripted love. Um, but just in case you, I mean, when you read the article, hopefully it will make sense now. Also on this page, uh, one option here is a family resemblance view. There is X love or Y love, but no general theory of love can be had. Such a family resemblance should sh such a family resemblance account should surely be on the table as an option. It is possible that love and art are like Hilary Putnam's example of jade. So, what is Hilary Putnam's example of jade? So, for a while, uh, people were going around finding jade. You know, you dig in the ground and you find some pretty rocks. Some of those pretty rocks are green and jade-like or whatever. And they would say, oh, we found some jade, and there were jade sculptures, and people were trading jade back and forth. And then at one point, 
geologists were looking more closely into this and they said actually this thing we've called jade if you go into a store and you see a bunch of jade statues really some of them are made out of this thing called jadeite some mineral called jadeite and the other is made i uh, i think it's called nephrite so there's sort of two minerals that look basically the same jadeite and nephrite and uh, we've just been calling them all jade what do jadeite and nephrite have in common mineralogically uh, not a lot, I guess. You know, they're both green and they look alike, but uh, they're different minerals. And so what does that have to do with the example he's talking about here? Well, you don't know yet, but when you read this paragraph, now you'll know what this example is because he doesn't explain it. I think this article was sort of written for, the, well, no, I, I know this article was sort of, it was written for a conference in honor of somebody. So he's sort of talking to fellow philosophers and not really explaining anything. And the final example of him not really explaining anything, which I talk about, not because it's important to understand, but because it's just an interesting topic on its own. So you can stop watching if you want, because this has nothing to do with love at all. But um, he says, yes, the lover may speak of the value of the beloved. The lover may say X is valuable. But like the student relativist, the lover will quickly add to me which shows how far we are from morality. So who, who is the student relativist? So what he has in mind is that it's very, very common for sort of undergraduate students, people around your age, uh, studying philosophy or not studying philosophy, but especially studying philosophy and getting exposed to these topics. It's very common to sort of be relativists either about morality or sort of about everything, but at least especially about morality. And so the student relativist is this sort of very common person, perhaps you are this person, uh, who says, look, all moral value is uh, relative. Why is there this like picture of a student relativist? The reason that this is sort of a phenomenon that a philosopher would sort of highlight is that uh, most philosophers are not relativists about morality, and most philosophers are not relativists about everything too. So you could be a sort of relativist about everything, or just about morality. You could say everything is relative or morality is relative. And this is much, much more common in undergraduate students than it is in professional philosophers. That's not to say there are no relativists. There's plenty of philosophers who are relativists about morality, and there are plenty who are, rel well, there, there are some who are relativists about everything. Uh, but sort of compared to students, uh, relativism about both kinds is much more common for undergraduates. What should we say about this? I don't know. It's an interesting uh, phenomenon, but that's just if you're if you're curious, like he's talking about this person, the student relativist. Who is that supposed to be? It's just this very common phenomenon among undergraduates of all shapes and sizes, all over the world. Uh, they all love relativism, and that's it. <laughs>